I love how weird I love like how weird it was trying to explain to like <laughs> children and stuff. No, we love Michael Jackson, but he's just eccentric. He's, <laughs> you know, he's eccentric. It's, and like the more stuff that came out, it was just like, yeah. look the other way. Look the other yeah. way. But he grew up having a pet rat. That's the same. That's the same. <laughs> I mean, that's all. Did he got. hold the pet rat? Out of windows over balconies? Or? Nobody wrote a song about it and it won a Golden Globe Award and a Grammy. What song was written about the rat? Ben. Ben, the two of us need look no more. That's amazing. We both found what we were looking for. That's about a rat? <laughs> That's about a rat. Because they couldn't afford pets, so this rat that would come in their house was his buddy. That is interesting if you think about, like, how different. Here, let's move all this stuff. Yeah, we've got a clip of the table and a watch to start. But think how different his life was. Yeah. Growing up that poor to, like, yeah. like being a super famous person. Mm hmm. That in, it, that that in of itself so. will, like, throw you. Mm hmm. You know? Yeah. Is there anything we want to talk about at the top of this episode? I forgot which one we're doing. I'll talk about the Facebook group. Okay. Betray you. Betray, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, how's it going? Eric's already laughing. We're in good shape. I'm not laughing. And I left my hat over there. I'm just going to assume my hair looks great. It does. Thanks. It does. Thanks. Yeah. Do you know, the other day I was getting a haircut and the lady told me that she felt like my hair was thinning and that she had special shampoo to sell me. I did not buy any because the time I got my hair cut before that, she said that my hair was so thick it was difficult to work with and would I like her to thin it out with the like thinning shears. And I'm pretty sure she thinned out my hair <laughs> so she and then sit. told me I was losing it. Is that, is that possible? <laughs> is there such a thing as hair care malpractice? There should be. There is now. There is now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I went home though and for like 10 minutes of the car ride, I was like picturing my brother-in-laws who are bald. Uh-huh. Actually brother-in-law who's bald. Uh-huh. And thinking, that will not look good on me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but then I remembered, wait a second, she's the one that made it this <laughs> she thing. She made it that thing. Just so she could sell you some Shampoo. I don't know. It's about the upsell nowadays. Do you know, I, I'm a bit of an idealist and I was frustrated to pay to get my haircut anyways. Mm -hmm. And I tried to shave it myself this summer. I just buzzed it right off yeah. and it looked so bad and uneven. No, and it looked lumpy. good. I think you did a good job. Oh no, it was bad. No, was in it? fact, um, I went in and basically said, could you give my head like the right shape? I know you can't make the hair grow back, but could you like shape it so that it looks like a head? <laughs> and <laughs> she, this complete stranger, I, cause like, I'm like a haircut whore. I don't, I don't go to the same place. Like uh -huh. I, any place I can walk into and get a haircut, and it yeah. usually ends in a clip, yeah. that's where I go. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not into like, it's like, Look, no matter what I do, I'm a 40-year-old man. It, there's only so much you can do with it, uh -huh. right? It's like, I have an ugly head no matter what, so, and it's going to grow back. So, like, I just walk into anywhere uh -huh. and say, give me a haircut, yeah, right? right? And so, the lady I went into after, yeah, so I never stick around. Uh -huh. Like, I think they think, like, oh, we're developing a relationship, and then I'm just gone. Gone. You know? Gone. And part of it is that when I'm driving around, I think, I'll get a haircut and just pull in. Mm -hmm. Another part of it is that because I was a pastor for so long, people confess to me automatically. Oh, automatically. Like if I sit down and get a haircut for 20 minutes, I don't know what my problem is or what vibe I give off, but by mm -hmm. the end of it, I will know like the worst stuff that's going on in their lives. In their life. And I don't really want that information when I'm getting a haircut and I don't want to solve those problems. You don't? No. <laughs> no, and I know it's just because I'm like, nice and empathetic um, and they can just tell like they care. Can, yeah. Um but now you can clearly see I'm also cool, also cynical. So he's cynical. No. no. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> anyways, anyway. after I shaved my own head, yes. I went to get my hair cut and this lady I had never met sits me down in the chair and says, "Did you do that yourself?" And I was like, 
yes. <laughs> and she said, never do that again. Never do that again. So anyways, <laughs> I tried to just cut my hair myself. That's a no-go. Oh. I don't think I'll be going back to the, like, thinning hair huckster, though. That's over. That's over? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're on to new things. We new. are. <laughs> Should we do a new poem? Okay. All right, cool. Um, oh, before we do that, yeah. uh, anyone that wants to... Oh, that's um, right. The group. Yeah, our Facebook group has a couple of people trickling in, and we just announced it, and we're just starting it, and we're not running any ads to it yet. But if you want to be invited into like the process of how we make our art, if you want to be a part of when we actually do sit down and tell a Bible story or tell a Greek mythology story or tell an Egyptian story like the old show, we're going to start doing that live in the group about once a month. You can join the group in the show notes or the YouTube comments and be a part of that. And when you join, you get a free gift. Guess what I did? <laughs> I decided rather than just like give everyone our first poetry volume, why don't we just give them a choice? Oh, uh, so like I took everything that was in the digital press, mm -hmm. the House of the World, like House. retelling of Genesis one in ancient Near Eastern context and like classic set to like hip hop. Mm -hmm. I took that. I took the audio book on how to pray for a world on edge called mm -hmm. to heal our world. It is mm -hmm. basically like what's Jesus teaching on prayer really about mm -hmm. in first century Jewish context. Yeah. Um, yeah. I took that and then I took um, warrior, our poetry warrior. pack on yeah. the connection between creative art and ancient warrior code, like code. Yeah. I put all three of those things just available as options. So, oh, so you give them a choice between... Yeah, they can pick. So when you go to our Facebook group, there's three questions. Um, basically like, do you want to join the group? Okay, great. Uh, okay, and great. <laughs> which gift do you want? And you click one of the boxes. And then three, where can I send it? And right. you write an email. And you get the, the gift and you enter the group. Right? All right. That sounds kind of like triple ripple to me. <laughs> it is tri it's triple ripple questions. <laughs> triple, triple, triple. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. So if you yeah. want to join the group, uh, we would love to have you. And you can ask us anything about the stuff we make or leave us any comments. Like it'd be cool if you tried this. Um, and I have like all sorts of ideas for fun stuff to do in that group. I yeah. won't give any of it away now. Oh, see how he is? But yeah, you can either search Text and Rock group on Facebook or just take the URL that's in the show notes and put it in your browser and shazam! Shazam. And I know that I haven't been on Facebook for probably a year, year and a half, but I ch I'm changing that. You are? <laughs> I did invite you to the group. I'm going to try. I'm going to try it's so really hard. Face, social media is so draining. It That's is. like why I want our group to be like only hopeful and life-giving and like a place that inspires you to make your own art. Yeah, like, that's beautiful. Say that again. Well, I mean, that's the change in the show is like yeah. what, what does it look like not to just make the art but to show everyone what's behind the scenes yeah. and behind the thinking when we write a poem yeah. and to yeah. document the whole thing. Yeah. So that you make your own stuff. So like the creative impulse that's in you to make the world better gets expressed. Yes. Like if we're not afraid to do it, why should you be? Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, so today's poem, you ready? Ready. All right. Okay. It's called Atreyu because I'm a huge fan of the never ending story from when I was a kid. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I may have had multiple dreams about riding on a luck dragon and getting back in my bullies yeah. in middle school. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, they, I hope they fear you now. I'm sure they don't. They don't. Um, <laughs> Do they even remember who you are? <laughs> jokes on them. I grew up to be 5'2". Uh, um, <laughs> but it was formative. Do you know one time... Um, <laughs> In gym class, there was this like eighth grader that the stuff of like legends was made of. He was in eighth grade for the third time when I was in 
seventh grade and seventh and eighth grade had gym together oh, together and yeah. so i'm in with this like kid that should have by rights been a 10th grader he literally drove to junior high school <laughs> and he would pick on me in gym class and what? yeah and one time my gym coach which was a great guy mm -hmm. um and he saw i had a spark in me like he's the one that nudged me to go out for the wrestling team oh, even though i was is. like 60 pounds soaking wet Right? Mm -hmm. But anyways, one time he was like, Schaefer, you need to stick up for yourself. And I was like, okay, coach. And the very next day, he found me locked in a gym locker. Like it was the kind you could see out of, like that yeah, mesh wiring. Mesh wire. And I'm in the locker and Coach Riley comes up and he's like, what happened, Mark? And I said, I stuck up for myself. <laughs> Oh, huh, that wasn't the way it was supposed to go, was it? No, so anyways, the never-ending story about a kid that finds the strength in himself to fight back the nothingness and the abyss that is being bullied in middle school yeah. was right up my alley. And so, <laughs> Atreyu is actually an adult version of that poem. Right. Like, right. what does it look like as an adult to confront the nothingness and honestly, like, the nihilism that's creeping into yeah. Western culture yet, yet again. Um, yet again. Yeah, I mean, we kind of keep going again. through cycles of nihilism and then rediscovery of the, the divine. Uh -huh. And you might say that's been happening since the 1920s, but I would say that's been happening yeah. since antiquity. Yeah. If you look at um, around the first century in Greek philosophy, so that mm -hmm. is in, in like, the way the most educated people were thinking about um, the cosmos, mm -hmm. all three of the dominant systems were ultimately materialistic. And so you might name God, but you were really not naming God. Right. You, you, you actually thought that we were ultimately here alone and nothing was going to save us and mm -hmm. things were either predetermined or not, but nothing was guiding us. Yeah. And in the first century, what happens is the rediscovery of the transcendence. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's the New Testament and all of the Jesus stuff. There's also Philo of Alexandria saying that right. whatever God is, it's not like a big human. It's more like the transcendent that makes everything go. Right. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does. Um, <laughs> someone had Philo like beat into them. I think so. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> there have been cycles throughout history of us standing back from the idea of divinity and saying, I don't know, I don't buy it, like mm -hmm. in human philosophy, but then rediscovering it and giving it better names and better yeah. language. Yeah. And I would argue about every 500 years, there's an overhaul in how we fundamentally name God, yeah. even in traditions like Christianity. The mm -hmm. God being named in late antiquity through Christian tradition is very different than the God being named in the Reformation yeah. or in the Enlightenment. Right. And so right now, I would argue that there is a nihilism and a, it's like basically, is anything guiding this whole thing or does anything care about this whole thing? I mean, the right. whole human experiment seems pretty yeah. flimsy right now. Right. Right. creeping yes. into yes. a lot of our thoughts and a lot of our kind of philosophies, if we're honest. Yeah, right, right. right. Um, and so I wanted to write this poem based on kind of what gave me hope as an eighth grader, giving me hope all over as an adult. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You and mean it wasn't the force? Oh, there was, that was there too. Oh, okay. Um, all right. <laughs> I may... <laughs> have tried to use the force as a, as a fifth grader, like in class, while my teacher was talking about God knows what. <laughs> Sorry, Mrs. Schneider. Oh I was over there like... <laughs> Do we have time for a funny aside? Yes! Oh my gosh. <laughs> I've worked with a lot, hundreds of students over the years as a youth pastor. One of my favorite students is named Connor and he has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and Connor loves Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, to this day, I do not know a bigger Star Wars fan in the world than Connor Fenton. Wow. And he's just such a kid that taught me, man, that sometimes 
you will look at someone and think they have a disability mm-hmm. and that you're helping them through life yeah. when in reality yeah. they have joy that like no one else is in tune right. with right. and they're helping you yeah. through reality right. and the mess of the world yes. by like showing you yes. that wonder and that uh-huh. joy and Connor I mean oh my gosh the amount of times we talked about Star Wars I yeah. can't even count them Yeah. and anyways Connor was like really easy to get along with unless you really rubbed him the wrong way okay. and he used to do the funniest thing What's and people that? wouldn't know what he was doing he would try to Darth Vader choke you from a distance. From a distance. And it was like, he knew it was inappropriate to actually come after you, mm-hmm. but he would go like. <laughs> and one time I was at this I retreat with a group of students and I was there with a group from another place. <laughs> and some of the kids were like, I could tell Connor just wasn't sure about it. It wasn't that they were being mean or that he was being mean. He just wasn't sure. And one of the kids said something and Connor just looks at me and then goes. (laughs) And the kid from the other group was like, what's he doing? And I was like, just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I thought you were going to tell me the other kid was like. "Ah." That would have been amazing. And I would have called the news. It's real! I can prove it! I can prove it! Release him, release him. Okay, so, Atreyu. Yes. Starts with this idea of materialism, and it just says, your assertion of ultimate meaninglessness and materialism is a cold, dark vacuum. And then I just admit, believe me, I felt it. Yeah. Because I think all of us, no matter how much we would classify ourselves as a believer, there are days and times in life where we cannot see a rhyme or a reason to anything. And it seems like evil is just winning Mm -hmm. and that darkness is just winning. Right. Yeah. And then there's this great reflection on the scene burned into every kid that grew up in the eighties mind where Atreyu's horse Artax is drowning in the bog of despair. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then it moves on to say, well, yeah, like, of course, we all wonder about these things. Right. That's okay. But then it gives people another way to think about the soul inside of yourself. Yeah. As evidence for God and goodness and wonder and that there's a rhyme and reason to everything. Yeah. And it's a quote from Xenophon in mm-hmm. Memorabilia where he says this. He says, the soul that is, this is the part of you that's the like essence that you would say, this is the part of me that says I or me mm-hmm. or that is observing others or that has friends like Eric or like yeah. that knows this about yourself. The internal part of you that you know exists, right? Yeah. You can't doubt that that exists. Right, right. Basic day card, I think, therefore I am. Right. I know that I'm thinking. <laughs> right? So Xenophon says the soul is that which is in us that participates in the divine and that which in us rules. Mm-hmm. And so the thing, the like personhood that's in you calling the shots is your soul and one of its fundamental characteristics is is that it's participating in the divine. In the divine, right, right. Just by breathing and living and moving and being. Yeah. Isn't that profound? Right, right. And I just say that X marks the spot on two things that he espouses. One, the greatest way to make sense out of the world and your humanity Mm -hmm. is to participate in your maker in the ongoing creation of the world. Yeah. Um, I think that fundamentally humans are supposed to be miniature makers because we're miniature versions of the divine. Of the divine. Like Genesis 1 says we statue the divine or we're made in the image image of God. It's why you feel so alive when you organize a room that's been a mess forever. Yeah. Or you make a rhythm and, and you like created it out of thin air, yeah. right? Yeah. Or you draw a piece of art or you help a child to do the same. It's like mm. you realize I'm helping this creature create yeah. and, and it feels divine, Yeah. right? Yeah. It's why some of you are songwriters or poets. It's why 
if you don't consider yourself an artist, you do have a craft and a vocation and something that deeply matters to you yeah. that you're on mission to accomplish. Right. Creativity is not always the fine arts. Right. 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 You may be creative in organizing something that really matters yeah. to make the world go. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, right. And so when we are creators, we image our maker. And that's the part of your soul that's participating in the divine because ultimately God, divinity, yeah, yeah, yeah. is a creator and is generous. I'm making things and giving it. I'm making, making things, things and in, giving it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And two, the second thing Xenophon um, says is that this house of the world that is the miniature house reflects the upper house. And so since we're participating in the divine, the kind of world we create here really matters. Mm -hmm. So when I say your right. house right. is an abode, I mean it's a divine abode. Yes. You're creating a, a house of the world that should match the house of the heavens. And it's a very Jesus way of thinking about our time here mm -hmm. on earth. Mm -hmm. His image for God is that God is a loving father and that that father has created a house. And our job as kids of the house is to participate in the business of the father. Right. And back then, father wasn't like a patriarchal term that was bad, and father wasn't a term that made tons of people thinking about abandonment and like dads that didn't measure up. Right, right, right. right. To be a dad was a, like a father of the house was a big deal and not a job anyone was shirking. Yeah. And to have a father meant you had safety and a business that made your family thrive and have enough food to eat and meaningful work serving the father of the house to make the household to run. To make it run. You mean that you come to me on my <laughs> daughter's <laughs> wedding day? <laughs> Is that the opening to The Godfather? I think so. <laughs> You're so awesome. I love it. <laughs> so I couldn't make my... I, I got it instantly. <laughs> so I knew it was the Godfather. Yeah. In the first like millisecond. Really? It took me a second to pull the line. Uh -huh. like, oh, that's right at the beginning. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so I just argue that your soul houses the divine and the house we're creating in the house of the world mm. matters because of the divine, and then there's just an encouraging line at the end, not to give up. Not to give up. Right? Right. Right. And this might sound like cheesy or cliche, but I look at like a tragedy that's like happening right now in Turkey mm -hmm. and Syria, like the earthquake. Oh my gosh. Thousands of people have died and we don't know why. Yeah. And there's no moral reason you can figure out mm -hmm. why buildings would collapse in on families. Yeah. There's just no good explanation, mm -hmm. and there's no good explanation within God. It's just something that goes into, these are the things we deal with in the world that mm -hmm. make us want to quit and make yeah. us feel like evil's winning yeah. bucket. That's where you put it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there have been so many headlines about the people that are helping, yeah. about the people that are working tirelessly, tirelessly to yeah. dig others out, yes. to give people blankets, to mm. give people food and warmth and shelter right. in a cold winter. Right. Um, I heard a guy on NPR recently interviewed that had brought his canines, his dogs, all the way from LA just really? to dig people out of the rubble. Wow. Like he stopped everything he was doing and that's wow. what he went to do. Wow. I mean, isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. I think it was Mr. Rogers that said something like this. Whenever tragedy helps or strikes that you cannot understand, look around for the helpers yeah. because that's where the goodness is. Yeah. Like you won't find the goodness in trying to explain why. Yeah. But you'll find the goodness in humanity reflecting divinity by being creative and generous in asking how can we help. Yeah. Right? And so that's kind of what this poem is about, and we hope you love it. Absolutely. All right, everyone. That's it. That's it. Be good to each other. Be good to each other. <laughs> All right.
Ai! É. <risos> Your assertion of ultimate meaninglessness and materialism is a cold, dark vacuum. Believe me, I've felt it, gripping me like a tray, creeping across Fantastica, drowning my horse. I loved that goddamned horse. Of course, we all wonder about the purpose and about source. Many friends I love can find no recourse. And so, I hear what you're saying. Believe me, I feel ya. But listen, Xenophone says in his memorabilia that the soul is that which in us participates in the divine and in us rules. And so, I find X marks the spot on two points he espouses. One, we have a means to join the divine in the ongoing creation of the world. You rhyme your maker when you create what is Tov Mayod. I love this goddamned world. And two, your house is an abode that matches an essence beyond space and time and holds awareness of day-to-day -day and Milky Way. It's the soul that the body houses. So do not give up when the black void thunders. The beginning of divine knowledge is wonder. That was cool. Yeah, definitely. That was all right. I tried to make it like a real mess and then try to clean it up. Yeah. See how it, <laughs> see how it hits. I think you. I think you were successful. At making messes, I always have been. Oh, have you really? Oh, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> you gotta be good at something. <laughs> were you? So when you were like, yeah. when you were like. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Were you like a compliant kid that obeyed what adults asked you to do, or were you like me? It. Can I still be punished if I? No. <laughs> I have a ten-year rule. I wait ten years, even to this day, to tell my mom and dad things that I think might wildly disappoint them. What? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I think I was. I was I was kind of on the fence. Okay. Where I could be seen as a good kid or bad kid depending upon where you were. <laughs> yeah. You said that a number of times you were kind of shy. Were you shy when you were that young or did that happen later? No, I was I was really shy at the, the So you could slide under the radar. Yeah. Right? Mhm. Mm okay, so I had this friend named Chris Schwartz when I was um growing up. Uh -huh. And he was a great wrestler. Like he wrestled in college. Yeah. And one of the only reasons I was like a pretty good wrestler was that uh -huh. Chris was like great, right? Yeah. He started when he was like really little and yeah. all the way through he was just phenomenal and kind of pulled me towards goodness, right? Yeah, right, right. And Chris was quiet but conniving. Yeah. And when we were in high school, yeah. Like uh, I think we were juniors. He invented the WFC, the Wrestling Federation of Champions, and he started a professional wrestling league in our high school wrestling room, really? which was in the upstairs of the middle school. Yeah. And he coordinated so many things, all while being quiet and having all the teachers think he was like the greatest kid ever, where I would get in trouble for mouthing off like daily, yeah. right? Chris had a notebook and he was writing up like characters and like all of the, you know how like professional wrestlers always are in feuds and fights? Mm -hmm. He was writing up all these plot lines. The plot lines, and he, oh my god! He made contracts and he would sign these people to like do different jobs for WFC and they would have mm -hmm. to sign the contract. He even had ring girls that like, you know, would really? walk around like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like Macho Man, Randy yeah, Savage right. would come out with a ring with, girl. With the, yeah. yeah, and like, he drug all of these old mattresses that got thrown out on the curb that probably had scurvy and bed bugs and God knows what. Uh -huh. He drug them up. 
He first of all put them on his car and had another friend sit across from him and put an arm out and we would carry the mattress to the middle school and we would take it up into the wrestling room at night only because we had been entrusted with the keys so that we could practice wrestling. And we drug up maybe 12 old, decrepit, gross mattresses up there. And for the entire next wrestling season, our team struggled with ringworm and no one knew why. Anyways, Chris was like quiet, but like formed this entire federation yeah. right under the radar. Wow. Whereas I got in trouble like every day and never did anything brilliant. <laughs> I mean, is that funny? That's incredible. So you were like quiet, but you could you could connive. I could plan. I could connive and plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nothing like that. That's well, amazing. He's an extraordinary person. I mean, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. For for all like the for all the for all the like writing projects I have that are about substance and like I'm always trying to like inspire people with my writing, mm -hmm. I thought that the greatest gift I may ever give before I die is to try to write up exactly what happened with the Wrestling Federation of Champions. Yeah. And go back and like interview uh, friends and uh -huh. you know get it straight from Chris. Yeah. But it was it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Incredible. Yep. Incredible. I mean, the storylines and everything. It was it was amazing. And they were like, he planned such interesting matches. He had, so I grew up in Kirksville, Missouri, and it's like a small town. It's like 18,000 people mm -hmm. with like a billion churches and enough bars to match. <laughs> and like, it's maybe three miles across the whole town. Uh -huh. And the first match that he built was called the Cross Town Match. And my friends Scott Bronner and Mike Deerling had a match that went from one end of Kirksville, Missouri, clear to the middle school on the other end, and it finished up in the wrestling room, where he had like 75 people waiting to watch the end of the match because he had advertised it so well. It was brilliant, right? Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Wrestling Federation of Champions. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. We eventually got shut down because Chris made one fatal error. What's that? He signed the principal's daughter, Rachel, to be one of the ring girls, and Principal Williams found out about it. Oh, and we were done after that. Really? Yep. Oh, man. Yeah. Which is good. Oh, I mean, it's amazing there were no lawsuits. Or like, yeah. Imagine if someone really got injured really being got like injured. suplexed into an into old, dirty <laughs> ringworm mattress. I mean, what do you do with that? And how do you explain that to parents? To parents. The news would have been KTVO. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yep. Wow. Mediocre, but bored news people yeah. would have showed up. <laughs> Fast. Fast. We gotta get this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We should shut this off. Okay. All right. Man, that is an amazing story, though. True life. Wow. What, do you keep in touch with him? Is he still? I haven't talked to him in a while. Yeah. I kept in touch with him really well for about a decade, but now it's been like, gosh, two decades. Two decades. Since yeah. I was like growing up and uh -huh. I need I need to check in with him. Yeah. <laughs> and he need to write that book before I die. Cause it's, it's really the most interesting thing I've ever done. Not any of this nerd <laughs> stuff. I was just a cog in his amazing machine. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. And my character, okay. Oh yeah, what was your character? My character was the Unabomber, <laughs> named because I got in trouble when the actual Unabomber existed and was like in the news. I made a superhero sketch. I was always drawing like superheroes, like comics. Mm -hmm. And I made a comic called the Unabomber that carried this like bag of bombs, right? Mm -hmm. And had a package in the other hand. <laughs> And I thought it was hilarious. It really wasn't timely. I think it could have flew like 10 years after the Unabomber, but not yeah. at the time of. And I got marked straight to the office over that. I mean, they were worried, like, this kid's hero is the Unabomber. <laughs> and it was really that I just hadn't like grown into my creativity. Right. Yeah, I was like three times growing up called into the office over my art, right? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just because I hadn't learned like to walk the line of appropriate. Line yeah. Of, yeah. Um, yeah. So when I learn that, I'll let you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> when I learned it, I'll okay, let you know. Bye, everyone. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that's like that song I sent you. I've never sent.